they might come out and not say, right. Their yard is pretty much uh, mesquite scrub, no grass. So 
you know, out of this, you can kind of see it more, even at the, the program level design, you see iterators. Uh, in Rust, they're done with a cool way. We essentially take the behavior of iteration, and we say this is a trait. And you can implement that trait on anything. So you ask yourself the question, uh, is this made up of multiple parts uh, that are all the same or similar? And if so, does it make sense to provide my users an ability to iterate over? If it does, you implement this trait for iteration. And the cool thing is that all of the rest of the language knows what that means. So what does that mean? It means that if you implement a trait for iteration over this select all the houses on the street query, right, then someone will be able to use it in a for loop. You don't have to write any code. They can say for house in, you know, result. Uh, do this code block, and then they have house set, right? So, uh, anyway, very useful. You'll find it in a lot of languages, uh, so much so that languages that implement iteration, and mostly iteration, uh, we have even begun calling them iterable languages, because that's how you need to learn to think to write in those languages. So, uh, we've been here in iterable language, and the way that we are, uh, Defining this is, is changing quite frequently. So an iterator, you can see that they were made in 1974, they're ancient, and here you go. In different programming languages, you can see C sharp, C having methods for iteration, uh, Java, Scala, MATLAB, PHP, uh, Python, Braku, which is Perl 6 or was, Ruby. Uh, so all of these languages have this this thing. So this is this is really a way we have to learn to think. Okay. So uh, a closure is is also a really simple thing to think about. Uh, you can think of it like this: a closure is just like a function. The only difference is it runs in an environment, right? So if you have a function that runs in an environment, you don't have to pass all of the variables into that function, right? And if you don't have to pass all the variables into that function, you can say, this function closes over the environment. And I'll give you a different example, and we'll go ahead and write this in Perl, just for simplicity. Perl. Yep, because I want to show you this in another language. This is very simple. We're going to go down here, and I'm going to say here, sub foo, right? And this is a function in Perl, print 42, right? Now, that's going to be very simple. If I just say foo down here, you're going to see it say 42. Now, what I can do here is let's put 42 inside of a variable, right? So I'm going to say my a equals 42, or let's do something my, my variable equals 42. Now I'm storing 42 in a variable. Now I can return that variable. And then I can see that uh, when I print the variable I return, I get 42. But there's something else you can do, which is kind of deep. You can return a subroutine, right? So if I say right down here, return sub, right? And then I return the variable. Now, when I call this, you can see it's printing the subroutine. It's saying, this is an actual subroutine that I'm returning. And I can call that subroutine to get access to that variable, 42. So this act right here is very simple, and I'm using this in not Rust because I think it's easier to see it. In this, I'm creating a variable in the environment. I'm calling it a variable, I'm storing 42 in it. And I'm returning a subroutine that has access to that environment, right? That subroutine that I'm returning uh, has the only reference to variable. There's no other way to get access to variable here. You can only get access to variable by way of the subroutine I'm returning. So we would say that subroutine is a closure, and it closes over a variable. Uh, and we're going to see how that works in Rust as well. It's the same idea, just more or less. So this is a distinction. Uh, and in fact, uh, we made that slight mistake uh, last time, and I did correct it. Uh, the difference between anonymous functions and closures, right? Uh, very easily, the, the difference is something very few people actually care about. So they, they use these terms interchangeably in many contexts. But for the people that do care about it, it's very easy to be right all the time. If you're not closing over anything, you're an anonymous function. If you're closing over anything, you're capturing an environment that's external to the function you're returning, then you're a closure. And that's the, the actual difference. 
So a closure is a type of anonymous function that uh, gives you access to an environment, right? The so environment is a fair. Question, uh, I think we were using it in like an unwrap or else scenario last week or something like that? Yes, I think so. Uh, if we referenced like a variable at that moment when we were passing it into the unwrap or else, would that become a closure? Not if you're passing it in. But if you're not passing it in, yes. Okay. Right? So uh, a closure can actually access variables in the scope that's defined. You don't have to pass the variable in. Right? So let's go back to that, that uh, Perl example for one second. Let me show you something else just to make this clear. Okay. So in this case, the subroutine receives nothing. Right? I'm just going to add strict. And I'm only doing this because I wrote Perl in it today. So. just going to get whatever language I last use. So here, here's what we have here. If I, I have here the ability to return to take a variable, so now when I, when I run this, rather, you're going to see nothing has changed. It's still returning 42. Uh, it's still well. Uh, it's still returning 42. Now, what I want to show you here is that I can actually take in a variable from that subroutine. Like I could say here, uh, my argument, right? And then I could say, give foo 5. In this case, this is still a closure because it's closing over a variable. Even though it has an argument, it's taking an argument, it's still a closure. If I come over here, though, and I remove variable and I just write down argument, you could say that this is no longer a closure. It's only an anonymous function. Why? Because I'm no longer concerned with the uh, with the context that I'm getting called in, right? So I'm not closing over anything. Now there's actually an error here. Too few arguments for main and not that zero. Oh, that's the reason why. Because this would be down here. I'm putting it the wrong. So in this case, I'm taking an argument in from the subroutine I'm returning, and I'm giving that argument back. That's not a closure. There's no, argue, there's no environmental capture. Here, if I do this, it is a closure, because now I'm actually taking control of the, the, uh, the environment. Similarly, if I do this down here and I say, say argument, and then I return variable, just like I was doing before, this is still uh, a closure, because I'm still having to capture the environment. right? So at the, the lowest level, right, what you could say is that a function, the way a function is set up when a computer calls it, is the function actually has a frame, right? We talked about this briefly in the earlier part of the class. And I said the reason why the stack is faster than the heap is because when you're done with the stack, you just adjust it back to where it was when it began, and you can rewrite over all those variables in the next run, right? With the heap, you have to go find all these different allocations and release them all manually. With the stack, you just set the pointer back up where it was, and you're good. Uh, well, functions execute with the stack, right? So when you have a closure, what you're actually doing is saying, don't set that variable back, right? And the reason why is because that closure still has to have access to it. So that's the act there of not, not replacing stack pointer, not setting that back to where it was before, and allowing the stack to grow again, that we call an enclosure. There's actually something that's happening under the hood which says that old stack frame, I still need access to it. Right? Uh, okay. So capturing the environments with closure. Now we're going to see how Rust does it. And here we're creating this enum for short color. And there's a red and a blue variant for it. And we have this struct. And the struct has a vector of short colors. Right? So now we can either have you know, one shirt color red, one shirt color blue, or them all red, or them all blue. Uh, and what we're doing is we implement inventory. And on top of inventory, we have a, a method, or you could say, uh, well, I mean, well, you should say method, right? Giveaway and most stock. Right? Both of these take a reference to self. Uh, giveaway is going to return a shirt color. So it takes a user preference, and then hopefully, I guess, it returns whatever is most stock. 
Uh, and then most stocked is going to take the inventory and return the shirt color. And it's going to look all, over all the shirts and see which ones you have the most of. Uh, so we have this function main, which is what we're going to be running, and we create this inventory with three shirts that are all that are blue, red, blue, and we say that the user preference is for a red shirt, and the user giveaway we give it the preference, and we say the user with the preference blank gets this, right? And of course the giveaway is going to say, yeah, the, the giveaway is going to say if we have the present, if we have what you prefer, give it to you. Otherwise, give you whatever we have the most of. That's how that function giveaway works. Uh, so we print out user with the preference of whatever gets this thing, and then we do the same thing for user two. They have no preference, so when we give them, when we ask for the giveaway, they're going to get whatever we have the most of. That's it. Uh, the store defined in main has two, okay, this is just explaining the same thing I explained. We specify the closure, okay, there we go, uh, expression as the argument to unwrap or else. So here in unwrap or else, right, they, this is the closure that they want, that they're showing here. So I didn't even recognize it because I see them all the time. Uh, this method here is simply stating we have a function, right? That accepts no arguments and it simply returns self most stop. And you nailed it. Why is it a closure? Closes on self. Closes over self. Or over self. Exactly, 100%. So self is not being passed into the function. It has to have access to it. It has, it has access to it by holding the parent stack frame open and keeping that reference to self alive. Right? So that's what that, what that actually has to do. And what we're doing here is we've already explained this. Okay, we're done. Good. Uh, in fact, can we open up two of these so I don't have to join this? Uh, so running this code prints, if you have a preference of red, we have one red shirt, so you get red. The user with the preference of none gets blue, because we have more of them. Closure type inference and annotation. So the deal with this is not too difficult, right? In Rust, every function has to have a type. Every variable has to have a type. Uh, we talked about a process before in which types don't have to be written explicitly. This is called type inference. Exactly. 100%. So the way functions work with regard to Rust is you can be explicit about types or you can rely on type inference. Now on closures, as far as I know, still you have to rely on, uh, on type inference to some degree, right? So you can see down here where they're actually specifying parts of the type, like this number is type U32 and it's returning a U32. But that is not the full type of a function in Rust. It's not just what you get as an input and what you return as an output. There are other things like <coughs> how many times you can call it, what traits it implements, delete once. And I think we see some of those, if not in this chapter, then in future chapters. But the point that you should remember is that closures in Rust are also strongly typed. So you can type a function to receive a closure of a specific type. Then the people that are using your module, you can be sure that they're providing a closure of that right type. Uh, here you see fn add one version one, add one version two, add one version three. Uh, these all have, uh, I think, the same type. And it's in, well, no, they don't have the same type. This one is expecting. Uh, this one is a type that's not a closure. This one is a closure that does the same thing. It takes a U32 and returns a U32. Uh, this one is a type that takes an X and returns an X plus one. They say they'll produce the same behavior with their call, which is true. Uh, cool. 
For closure definitions, the compiler will infer one concrete type for each of their parameters and the return value. Uh, true. Okay. So it's just showing you that a closure can behave just like a function, I think is the takeaway here. Uh, not that they all have the same type. Capturing references or moving ownership. Okay, so here's where we're going to talk about, I think, I, I, don't, I don't think this is going to be stuff just yet. I was wondering when they're going to talk about closure typing, but I don't even know that it's, it's in this chapter. Uh, so here's what we have. We have a, a list up here of vector 1, 2, and 3. Before the closure, we print out the list. We have this closure here called only borrows, and it prints from closure, and then what is it closing over? List. Exactly, right? So it's taking no argument, so you know it's not getting it from the argument list. And we see this list variable. We know that it's taking it from the environment. The environment is up here where it's declared, therefore it's closing over list. Before call enclosure, we print it out, then we call this thing called only borrows, and then we print it out, right? And only borrows is going to, it's going to work, because it's only taking, yes, because it's not a mutable copy of this you're taking, right? right. So that's pretty simple. So you can close over anything so long as you're not mutating it and you'll borrow, you'll, you'll take an individual copy. Uh, file name source main, here we're defining this one, two, and three, and we're doing the same thing, but now we have this let me borrows mutably, and we're calling list.push, and we're giving it the seven. Now this changes it, all bets are off, right? Why are all bets off? Because what we're doing here is <coughs> We are, we have this immutable, rather this mutable borrow of list to do list.push. And this, it's showing it works. So let's see here, why did they say it works? We don't use the closure again after the closure is called, so the mutable borrow ends. Okay. Yeah, so, so borrow is mutably under, would it not work? Yes, then it would not work, that's right. So it's showing you here that it takes a mutable reference for this duration. Then it releases the mutable reference, and you're back to playing with the old rules. Does that make sense to everyone? So the rule is you can have as many unmutable copies as you want. You can only have one mutable copy. The thing is, if you give back the mutable copy, you're playing back in the old rules, right? Having as many unmutable copies as you want. So that works because it, the mutable copy ends here. All right, if you want to force the closure to take ownership of the values it uses in the environment, even though the body of the closure doesn't need, strictly need ownership, you can use the move keyword before the parameter list. Uh, and this is used all the time in this context, which they give it out right here. This technique is mostly used when passing a closure to a new thread to move data so that the thread is owned by the, so that the data is owned by the new thread. So when you have, uh, when you have uh, a piece of data, right, and you want to run it in a multi-threaded program, if that data isn't a primitive, right, like an integer or something that's copied, then what you need to do is move it into that thread. That thread needs to take ownership of it for that time. And you do that by using this, this move keyword here. It looks just like this. Now one thing to note is that this is slightly different than it would be if the move keyword was elsewhere, right? So move and then the pipes actually creates a, a, a move closure. And this is how multi-threading works. I think we do the multi-threading chapter, it's coming up, uh, fearless concurrency, using threads to So we're doing that in two days, right? We'll actually cover that and we'll build uh, multi-threaded things. Let's look at the definition of unwrap or else, a uh, method on option T that we've been using in uh, listing 3.1. So here's what we have here. We have this implementation, t on option t, and we create this function here called unwrap or else. Right? And we already know what unwrap or else does, it's used in the last chapter. Right? Unwrap or else takes a function that it calls in the event the unwrap is unsuccessful. So we have an option here. We represent failure in an option with a what? None. Exactly. Right? In a result, we represent failure with a A result is either okay or error. Exactly. So we represent failure in a result with uh, error or oh no, error is failure. Yeah, error. error. And we represent.
represent an error in an option with none. Exactly. So unwrap or else on an option says if this is a none, then I want to do whatever the closure is passed in. Right? Otherwise, just return the thing. And that's kind of how that works. Now, this is where you see the magic here. Uh, we have this trait here called fn once, And this is what I didn't really, uh, I didn't see it explained above, so I didn't really want to go too much into it. But there are essentially traits that are applied to closures, and those include things like fn once, fn mute, and fn, right? And these are things you don't apply to them. They automatically implement one, two, or all three of these, right? So the way this kind of works is at the highest level, you can think of function being any closure, right? Fn mute is being something that can borrow uh, the thing inside, right? So it needs to take ownership of it. And in fn mute, the ownership is given back when the function is not executed, right? Uh, because the ownership is given back, you can call them multiple times. So what would be a great example of an fn mute function? Anyone have one that comes to mind? I have one that comes to mind right away. Increment. Right? Increment is a great example of fn mute. If you had a function that needed to increment something, every time you call that function, you're taking ownership of it, you're incrementing, you're giving ownership back. Right? That's a great example. fn once means you can only ever call that thing once. What's an example of that? Okay, think about it like this. The whole entire language is built around this concept of ownership. And the responsibility of the owner of the data is to do what? Free what is done. Or give it to someone else. Free what is done, right? But we have a name for free what is done because you're not always free. It is done through drop, but uh, you, you could say clean up or destroy would be more accurate, right? Destroy the data. Because sometimes you're just staring at a socket or communicating remotely or whatever. But the idea here is basically that destruction is done by the owner. Right? And all destruction is fn once. You can only ever destroy something once. Right? So those three classes of functions are the way that Rust uh, automatically tags these. And you can ensure then that they're safe. Right? Like let's say that you have a, a function which does destruction on a type. And you pass it into uh, something expecting a closure, and it's going to call it multiple times. There's no way that's going to end up well. Right? Because it's going to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to destroy this, or I'm going to destruct this once, then you're going to call it again, and what is it going to do? It's not, it's not going to be safe. So these, these traits here apply to uh, uh, closures that make sense, right? And this is what makes them, makes them kind of work. Uh, okay, so in this case, Let's, let's fix on this one for a little bit longer. On this case, the fn once here uh, that we're taking in is the function, right? We have wrapper else, and it is of type fn once that returns a t, right? That means that when you say unwrap or else, uh, that is the strictest type of function in that you can only ever call that once. And why is that? Because unwrap on an option could be behind a pointer, right? And you can only ever get access to the thing behind a pointer once, right? So if you need the mutable access, that's how you do it. So unwrap or else here is coded very conservatively. And they say here, the trait is bound on the generic type f is fn once the t, which means f, f must be able to be called once. Take no arguments and return a t. Using fn once in the trait bound expresses the constraint that unwrap or else is only going to call f at most one time. This is the key here. That should be in bold. Right? It's not that you can call it once, which it said earlier. Right? It's not this. Uh, must be able to be called once. This is actually bad wording. It's this. That you can call it at most one time. Right? It's specifying the upward bound. Because all closures implement fn once, unwrap or else accepts the most different kinds of closures and as fixable as it can be. Cool. 
No, functions can implement all three function traits too. If we want to do, uh, if what we want to do doesn't require capturing a value from the environment, we can use the, the name of the function rather than a closure where we need something that implements one of the FN traits. And here we're creating a rectangle, and then we create three instances of a rectangle. So we define three different rectangles, and then we do list sort by keys, and we're again providing uh, a closure down here, R on R dot width. So this is going to go through the rectangle, it's going to return something that is sortable, right? So this sort by key is defining its result, R dot width, as having implemented, does anyone remember the trait? You're going to get mega brand once you remember this one. Should I give you a second? Can you see it again? What's up? Can you see it again? Oh. Uh, yeah. In order for something to be sortable in or us, cool. it has to implement a specific trait. You're in the right ball field, but you're off. Iterator? No, not iterator, not equal. Seek? Uh, no, not seek. I think he's going to get it. I think he knows it. in the right vicinity and where the docs and where this is at. That was done. I want SCD colon colon CMP. Uh, board? Ah, uh -huh. there you board. go. Good job. Life is an open book test. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd get it. That's exactly right. Uh, in order for something to be compared and ordered, then that thing has to implement this order trait, right? And the order trait says I can take two things of this type and return. Greater than, less than, or equal to. That's exactly right. So this closure is going to have to return something that implements the order trait in order for it to be able to be sorted. And, and that's actually good because it's not in the book at all. So there you go. We just want to do a back that is more detailed. Uh, this is contrived in complete way. It doesn't work. Try and count the number of times. What are we doing here? Hold on. Let's see what we're doing. Sort by key. Sort operations, push, value, part out with. Okay, so they're trying to see what is, how many times, they're trying to see what is getting pulled in the sort operation. Yeah. Okay. This is actually really close to working, so I don't know why they're critiquing this as being, you know, a bad idea. Uh, so here's what they're doing here. Uh, they have this thing sort by key, right? And essentially someone, this is like uh, a novice thing. Someone says, well, I want to make sure that this is working. So in order to make sure that this is working, sort by key. And that's getting called for every different value. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create this thing sort operations right up here, which is an empty vector. And I want to simply push onto that empty vector every value I see, right? So list sort by key R, sort operations, push value, and then uh, string from by key call. Actually, I, let me correct this. Let me correct this. I made a slight mistake. Rather than pushing every value you see, they're just going to push by key call. Right? That's the correction. So I thought that they were going to push onto this sort operations, everything that they're seeing, but they're not. They're just pushing on this, by key call. This is not going to work. Why is it not going to work? It's not going to work because you have only one copy of this string. Right? So one pointer on the E. And you can't push multiple different pointers to that into a vector. You're going to have to clone it. Right? So <laughs> that's it. You either have to clone it or share the reference. And that's, I think, a later part of this chapter. So this would compile if you put value.clone inside the closure? Uh, if you put, yes, exactly. Yep, 100%. Good job. So there you go. It's failing to compile. And what they're showing you here is a way you can kind of get the store, so you can have a, a num u sort operations equals zero, and then you simply increment it plus equals to one. And in this case, you're just implementing a function, right? Because that can be called as many times as you want. So now we're down here to the iterator stuff, and this is, I think, going to be much more interesting. It's far less uh, programming and far more how do we think and model problems. So iterator
iterators are lazy, meaning they have no effect until you call methods that consume the iterator to use it up. Uh, what does that mean? That means here is a vector, right? The vectors implement iterator, it, iterable in Rust, right? Yes, I think the trade is called iterable. Uh, let's, let's see here. RS uh, iter iterable. I forget if that's Rust or no, it's not. It's just iterator. Yes, it's just iterator. In in JavaScript it's, and Python, I think it's called iterable. Uh, JavaScript iterable. Uh, yes, iterable protocol. Okay. So it yes, it's so we have this vector, right? And you can think of a vector as uh, a thing that implements this iterator trait. And now we're actually getting to see how it works. So if we want to get the iterator out of the vector. If we want to get code out of a vector that knows how to iterate over that vector, we can call v1.iter. And what this is going to do is return a thing that we can call next time. And every time we call next, we're going to get the next element in the thing we're iterating over. So this is very popular. The first call is usually just returning the iterator. In some languages, it's also called next. In Rust, it's called iter. You call iter to get the iterator. Then you can call next over everything uh, and returning the value every time you iterate over it. Now what's also interesting is in Rust, this is lazy, so just calling iter doesn't consume the vector underneath, right? But as you iterate over it, you could be consuming the vector with drain, you know, like that's an example of an iterator that actually consumes the thing underneath. So why would you want to do something like drain, consume everything underneath? Let's say you're receiving packets to your like wireless card, and you have an iterable trait for those packets. You can drain them, processing the packets, and then every time you're done processing a packet, you just don't have to do anything, and the packet's gone. It's destructed automatically. So there's, that's very useful for when you want to process something once. You can just iterate, or, or iterate over it with drain, and then by the time it's done, you, you don't have to do anything. Uh, but here's an example here of them calling iter. So they have v1, and this is a vector of three elements. They call v1.iter. And now you can say for val and v1.iter. Now, if they didn't do this, if they said for val and v1, what would actually happen here? Uh, it would call into iter under the hood. That's exactly right, 100%. So it calls into iter under the hood, right? Uh, and the difference between into iter and iter is something that I don't even remember. So I just happen to know that there's that distinction there. So this is a, this is a quick question. What is the difference between into iter and iter? I think, here's what I think. I think into iter can return an iterator of a different type. And iter always returns the same type. But I'm not sure on that. But yes, the, you, you are right about that answer. So here's another thing that we're doing here. Uh, this time we're getting the version. Are you are you trying to find the answer? Uh, yeah. Do you have an answer? Not yet. I have an intuitive pull up, but I'm having trouble finding the answer. Just a bunch of different definitions for you. Wow, 406 people. What's the difference between intuitive and iterator? Uh, the iterator returned by intuitive iterator may yield any type. Reference to a type or a mutable type, depending on the context. The iterator iter will always be able to reference the type by convention. The iterator returned by iter mute will reveal a uh, mutable iterator by convention. So into iterator can yield anything. And iter must always return uh, a reference. Okay. Find something to look at it. But yes, there we go. Which is what I assume, right? I assume that into iter can iterate over different types. Um, so we have this thing here called v1 iter, and we're essentially saying here that we want to get this out of this vector. Again, this is nothing more than nothing abnormal. And then we call v1 iter.sum. This is showing you here that the sum method, right, is on what? On uh, the iterator. Exactly. So here's a question. Does the vector itself have a sum method? I don't think so. I don't think so either. 
uh, RS STD VEC. We're going to jump down here. So the only way to get the sum is the, to create the iterator and the consumer. Cool. All right. And then methods that produce other iterators. So this is an interesting thing here. When we call v1.iter, right, we're producing an iterator that we can call next time. Right? That's what that's returning. It's returning an iterator that we call next time. So it's actually. Uh, returning this right here, how to implement the iterator. And you can see that right here. So this is the public trait that we're returning. Now, there's a function here called map, and what map is going to do, right, given what we've just seen, is it's going to return something else that implements the iterator trait. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, an iterator is defined by this trait of behaviors. And if we call map on it, it's going to return something else that implements iterator. It actually is going to return map. And map itself is, uh, is an iterator, right? So I think it's an iterator. Hold on a second. Public struct map. That's interesting. Maybe something different there. The map iterator implements a double ended there you go. So it implements double ended iterator. Where? Oh, there you go. Implement double ended iterator for map. So yes. So map is going to return an object called map, which implements double ended iterator. So this is getting the iterator out of the vector, calling map on it, which is going to return this map object that also implements iterator. There we go. And you can see here the problem. The problem is that iterators like results must be consumed. And this one we're not actually consuming. So we're creating an iterator here from the vector. And then we're creating a map here from the map. And we're not doing anything with it. And it's giving you a warning that this doesn't actually do anything. So in order for the iterator to run, you have to consume that result. Right? You have to consume that map. And one method of consuming it is with dot collect. And we've seen this before too, right? So dot collect is going to actually require that that iterator to run until completion, and that's what the dot that's what we're doing here. So now we get back into this word closure and in the environments, and we're probably going to see the tie-in between this and an iterator. Uh, so we create a vector of shoes, and we do here's where we got it, right here, right? Choose into iterator, right? This is going to create to, for us the iterator that we need to call filter, right? And filter is non destructive, but it, filter needs to have s dot shoe size, s dot size, right? s dot size comes from s. Now, because s is being passed into this uh, anonymous function, right, we would say s dot size does not make it a closure, right? But we have this other variable here called shoe size. Where's that coming from? That's coming from uh, the function. So that would make a closure. Exactly. Because you're not explicitly passing in shoe size. If you explicitly pass in shoe size, not a closure. Because you're closing over the environment and you're not passing it in every time, it's a closure. And then we call dot collect to consume the whole thing. All right. Improving our IO project. So we had this project before where we created uh, these. We, we did argument parsing, remember? This was our, I think, guessing game? We made a guessing game in the last class, if I remember right? Uh, no, we made mini grip. Mini grip, that's right. We made mini grip in the last class. We had, uh, there we go. Query file path, ignore case. I think the guessing game was, was a couple of weeks ago, or more than that. Uh, but now what we're going to do is we're going to see that this environment var, I think, uh, rather not environment var, but environment can be a closure, uh, can be an iterator itself. Uh, <coughs> So what they're showing you here is at the time we said not to worry about the clone calls because we removed them in 
the future. Well, that time is now. So remember, we talked about, we, we, I remember having this conversation. We said that clone in Rust is something a lot of novices do because it gets you around the bar checker, right? But there's a drawback of clone in that it's always suboptimal performance. So you can get fixed on eliminating all copies of clone in your program and making the most optimal program you can possibly make, and you'll probably never get anything done. But uh, you should know how you can get rid of clones in an easier way. So now we're going to look at these two, arg1.clone and arg2.clone, and get rid of them in a different way. And here's one method in which we can do that, right? Uh, using the return iterator directly. So here we do nvargs collect. Uh, this is what our, our thing used to look like anyway. And now what we're going to do is this right here. So now we're implementing build on config. <coughs> now rather than build taking that vector, right, which we have to clone these things out of, we're giving it anything that implements an iterator where it's returning a string. That's what that means. So this, this says, I will accept anything as the first argument that implements an iterator and returns a string. Right? Uh, and it's showing you here how we can implement that. So this is the implementation right down here. And how do we do that? Well, we call args.next now instead. And args.next is going to return to us the first thing in that, that which is going to be what? Oh. Return the next thing, which is the file path to the program. Exactly. Yeah. The first thing in the argument list is always the, the path to the program to launch it. Exactly. And then the next thing that we have is right here, which is the query, and then the next thing is the path. So what we're doing here to eliminate the dot clone is what? Anyone want to describe the key thing that we're doing? Uh, we're not consuming the iterator until we're ready to do something with it, basically. Like we're, we're calling dot next when we're ready to, like, you know, unwrap the option. Yes, but there's something a little bit more explicit that I want to think about here. Okay, so let's take a look at this one, and then let's take a look at the earlier implementation, right? Uh, right here where we're calling into our, by the way, you were, you were right in everything you said. I just, I want to be, I want to show this a different way. Here we have nvargs, which is going to return an iterator, we're calling dot collect on it. So we're using that, that iterator immediately, right? What are we doing? We're storing the result in a vector of strings, right? In order to get the things out of the vector of strings, we're having to call dot clone. Why? Because a vector of strings can't represent, it's not there anymore. So because it can't represent, it's not there anymore, someone else took it, you can't take it. You've got to replace it with another string, right? So this is actually the book, I don't think it's going into these types of details, but I want you to think about it like this. If you have a vector of strings, you can never get the string out of the vector. Why? Well, you can, there's a workaround for it, but you can never really get the string out of the vector. The reason is very simple. Because that vector of strings, if you pull the string out of the vector, it's no longer a vector of strings. Because you've got something in there that represents where a string used to be, right? And what's, what's going to represent that? How does a string represent I'm no longer there? Right? The vector owns all of those strings inside of it. It doesn't give you a method to take one string out. Because there's nothing that can represent string or someone took it. Now, if you want to represent string or some, someone took it, you could use a option. Right. So a vector of an option of strings can easily represent someone took it. You can actually then remove the string and replace it with a none. And there's methods that do that for you. Is a vector mutable? You can make a vector mutable. In this example, is the vector mutable? In this example, the vector is not mutable. Okay. Then that then. then so I think if it was, you would just lose that element, right? But no, you can't just lose the element unless it's at the end of the vector, right? Then you could shrink the vector down. But oh, you, right. you, 
can't take an element out of the middle of a vector of strings because then what you have is a hole. And you've just said it's a vector of strings, not a vector of strings and holes. All right? So in order for it to be type safe, you can't have holes in that vector. So what you can do is rewrite the vector entirely so it's a new vector of strings. You can do that. Or you can replace one string with another string. You can do that. Right? But what they didn't do that in the earlier classes because replacing the entire vector with another vector is going to be slower than copying one string, right? It's a worse string off. And likewise, if you're looking at, uh, you know, replacing the vector with an empty string, well then every time you take a string out, you're having to clone an empty string anyway. What's the most you're saving? A couple of bytes? You know, it's just not a major difference. So in the earlier chapter, they said, don't worry about it, just use clone. Well, now we're not using clone. Why? Because rather than collecting the env args vector into uh, you know, a, a vector of, of this args, right? What we're doing instead is we're using the iterator to pull these things off one at a time. And then we never have to collect it, and then we totally skirt that whole problem that I mentioned, which the book probably doesn't go into much detail in, but it's, it's worth knowing. That's the reason why. And it's also worth knowing that if you can reason about it and say, well, what would a vector of options of strings do? You can easily come out with a better example, right? Uh, we can also take advantage of the iterators in the search function in our I.O. project, which is reproduced here in list 1321, as it was in list 1212 or whatever. Uh, okay, so now we had, we had, so they're showing here, this is what our search function looked like before. We have essentially two different components here. We have a file path we take, and then we resolve it to contents, and then we have a query string we take, and we essentially look for every line in the contents and see whether it matches the query. And they're showing you here another way you can do this. Now, this method of writing code is my favorite. This method of writing code is one in which everything follows this pattern uh, of contents.lines.filter.collect. That does everything the above did, right? So when you learn to master that below method of writing, you tend to prefer it in a lot of things, because you just start to see it. You know, it's like, this is the method that takes this type to this type. It, it makes a lot of sense. And notice the types on them are the same, so they're probably going to get compiled in the same type of code. Uh, that bottom form is frequently called the combinator type. So everything stays wrapped in something else, you know? And that's because iterators tend to have a lot of methods you can call on them that are also available to things like options and things like uh, results, you know. I believe you can even call dot .unwrap on an iterator. Now what would dot .unwrap on an iterator do? Return to you an element in the iterator, the first element in the inter iterator, or if it's not their pen. I'm pretty sure that's what unwrap on. Someone can look that up. I'm saying you tend to see a lot of these functions implemented on a lot of these traits, you know, and it's there for consistency. Yeah, I was just looking up in the in another language that I was familiar with. You can delete elements of them. Well, we call them arrays, but there's no term vector in that other language. They call everything's an array. Everything's immutable. Array, and you can delete. You can delete an element or a range of elements in the array. I'm sure it's slow. I mean, I'm sure it's not the speed performance of Rust. I'm just saying that in it's another just, language you can delete the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's think about this, right? I, I, I want to just use the opportunity to like. I'm, I'm sure behind the scenes, there's a lot of gyrations to make that work. Well, let's talk about it. What kind of gyrations are required? To make does anyone want to give this one a crack? Because you probably can only really take off, lop off the end, like you're talking about. Like you can, like you can push or pop or whatever. You can you can manipulate the end more easily than you can do something in the middle. Well, of course, right. But, uh, but the question is, you've got a language which allows you to, and this is a good. This is why I say, if you can figure out Rust, you can wrap your head around Rust. You can wrap your head around a lot of other languages. You can almost intuit how they work, just thinking about it. It's almost, you know, I, I get rust, so I understand how that's going to have to work. So, we, we talked about a vector, we talked about an array. Does anyone remember how I introduced an array? We gave you the very scholastic definition when we went over it. Uh, it's like fixed link on the stack? A, a vector that's immutable? I said it was a 
contiguous chunk of memory, right? So from the beginning of the array to the end of the array is the same chunk of memory, okay. right? Uh, so if you're going to remove an element from the middle of an array in another language, what do you think is happening? Fragmenting the memory. Well, that's one thing that could happen, yes. But what actually happens is, and this is the reason why the languages are slower than Rust, very frequently slower than Rust, it's not a real array. It's fake. They're lying to you. So what are they doing? They typically have a linked list. Perl does this. So every element in the array in Perl points to the next element in the array, right? Or you have it to where when you hit a certain amount of elements, you just reallocate and the whole thing. These are different compromises you can make to implement it. But in very few languages, is that array actually a contiguous block of memory for just this reason? How do you get around segmentation? How do you make it to where you can remove an element? You typically have to lie to the user about how it's implemented in order to make that happen. So if you have an array where each different element you create points to the next element and can point to the previous element, it's very simple to remove any, anything in the array. You take it out, you look at to where it was pointing to, you go there, and you make the where it came from where you were at, right? So it looks like this. Uh, I mean, I guess we don't, I, I can do it on the whiteboard and show you really quick here. In, in a lot of languages, you have this, right? You have you have this kind of thing going on, and they'll call this an array. And this guy is going to point to this guy. This guy is going to point to this guy. This guy is going to point to this guy. This guy is going to point to this guy. Right? So this is called a doubly linked list. And in order to make this work as an array, to implement this as an array, you say, I want to delete this, right? So they're going to say, this is A, this is the A array right here, right? And you say, you want to call delete, and then you say A1, uh, right? The first element, which is this one. You want to delete this. So you're going to go here, right? And then what you're going to do is rewrite this arrow to point instead to there, and you're going to rewrite this arrow to point here, and then you can get rid of the whole thing. So you're saying that's not really an array if it's set up like that? No, it's not an array. And I'll tell you how you know it's not an array. It very frequently happens. What do you, how do you get to the end of this array? you got to go through every element. Right? You can't see to the, the second or the third or the fifth element inside of it. Right? So the longer the array gets, the longer it takes you to get to the end of it. You know? But I'm just saying, like, you can obscure what an array is with an implementation like this, then you can remove elements from the middle of it. But it, it functions totally different. And in Rust, they give you access to both of them. They don't choose one implementation and say that's what you're stuck with. In Rust, you can get that. Use the doubly linked list if you want to get that structure. Use an array if you want to get the, the regular structure. But there's a difference there. But a lot of higher level languages forget that difference entirely. Mm -hmm. Like Python, uh, for instance, if you, if you have a key value pair, we talked about this. We said we could do it with different methods inside of Rust. One of the methods we talked about was a hash map, right? There's another one. There's a B tree map. There's a lot of different maps. We covered that in one of the, the collections chapters, right? In Python, they pick one of those, and that's the one you get. In Perl, they pick the hash map, and that's the only one you get. You know, in Rust, they give you access to all of them. They implement them for you. They say pick which one you want. But the words themselves, what they get called, that they're very you know straightforward and honest. If you have three different things, like in Perl, you have a scalar, you have uh, a vector, right, uh, or an array. We call it an array in Perl. You have a scalar, an array, and a hash. Those are three things. In order to make the whole work with those three things, they optimize them for simplicity, not speed. And that's how Python works too, and PHP, and all these other things. So you can always ask the question, if I can delete the middle of an array, how is that actually working? You can find some pretty disturbing things. Uh, there's some pretty pretty interesting compromises that you have to make in order to make that kind of stuff happen. Hey, what was the performance problem if you have a long array and it's a link list instead? You can't see a specific spot inside without iterating over everything. And you See. don't, right. So like with an array that's three sizes big, right? Each one of those boxes that I had on the original, you can think of that as being, you know, let's say eight bytes. To get to the second box, you don't have to go through the first. You take eight times two and add it to the start. If you want to go to the 500th box, 
You take 500 times 8 and add it to the start. You don't have to go through each one saying, where's next, where's next, where's next, jump it all around memory. You're not talking about the index, of, like if you wanted to go to the 500th index. Like in the language is simple, but you're saying behind the scenes it's, it's a high cost. Exactly. That's exactly right. Behind the scenes it can very frequently be a high cost. Okay. See, I guess that's all been hidden. Some people have programmed for years and they're, they're obscure, all that's obscure. They don't know what happens. Sure. Behind the scenes. I agree fully. Do you have a question? Good job. Uh, Okay, so we have, so, so yes, that's exactly right. Behind the scenes, these things can work uh, very suboptimally, you know. So rest, rest is a good job of that. All right, and I, I just want to stress this. If this form interests you, it's definitely attractive to learn how to write like that. Like that, in my opinion, is a much cleaner way of writing code. This is called uh, the combinator form, and it can get a little scary. It's definitely a little tricky. I was on, when I was learning it, on Discord with one guy for two weeks. And I kept asking him, how do I write this in this form? How do I write this in this form? And uh, he's an Australian guy. He became a really good friend of mine because he's extremely skilled with Rust. He actually writes it for the Windows kernel. He's a security engineer. And uh, his, his thing is every time he would see me, he says, oh, here comes Evan, and now we're going to do the flex. Right? Because I would take a program that wasn't written like this right here, and I would say, how do I write the entire thing like this? <laughs> how do I write the entire thing like this? And it was just testing what even he could do. Let me see if I have it here, uh, just for shits and giggles here. I'll show you how I learned. So this is, uh, uh, there was a test, there was a project in Vietnam. That was it, it was for the Vietnam company. And I want to go down here to source. See this? So we would go through something, and this is what we ended up writing. So look at the document, selective title, then I call this thing called OK, then I call this thing and then, which takes a result and another result, and you know, does stuff, and then I call this thing called as ref, and then I call map on top of it, and then I call and then, and then and then again, <laughs> and then I call mat, and then I call OK or, and I just kept doing this, right, for this was this was a thing. Like we would do this every night, and uh, we both got a lot better at writing these combinators and this this uh, method of writing code. At, at, at some point, it was just like laughable. Uh, I want to see if I have if I have the comment in there. It was really great. Oh yeah, here. So here's the rules. I, I would come up with these rules that would write the most convoluted code ever. I'd say. This is what I want to do. You must only say client error once. You must return a vector of a, a result of a vector string or a client error. No nesting blocks or nesting closures, right? So this is a closure, but you can have a closure that returns a closure too. And in order to do this, I was like, I want to keep it simple in appearance. So no nesting closures, and there can be no unwrap or try macro. And uh, you know, I would write down an example if we got it working, and then we would try to write it a different way. But these were the rules that I would write to just learn how to write the style of code. And then we would fuck around on Discord for two hours trying to like wrap our head around <laughs> what we were doing. We'd have like ten different command pages open for result and iterator and option, and you know, we'd be like, okay, we need to figure this out. You know, intermute dot flatten dot math dot collect. Got it. You know, uh, it was a real hack fest there. It's hard, but yeah. Now, now, I'm, now I'm not really that obsessive about it. I just want to learn. So I do, I do crazy things to learn. Uh, using the iterator trait methods instead of indexing. So uh, this is what we're doing here. 
And again, I said this is, you know, saying that we're going to do them instead of indexing is one thing. The real thing that's happening here is we're not storing everything in a vector. Right? That's really what the, the same is here. Uh, making code clearer with iterator adapters. Uh, so here's the iterator adapters. Okay, good. I was going to say, I thought we already looked at that. Uh, this down here is the other method. We say contents and then lines. Right? This is going to return an iterator of lines in the content. It's going to split them out by lines. Then we're going to filter where the line contains the query, and we're going to collect that into a vector. And here's another cool thing about collect. Collect works in this context without having a type, because the type is up here. So it knows what it has to make to make this function work. So collect can actually infer the type and do everything for you. The next logical question is, which style should you choose in your own code and why? The original implementation or the version using iterators? Most Rust programmers prefer to use the iterator style. It's a bit tougher to get the hang of first, but once you feel the various iterators, and get a feel for the various iterators and adapters and what they do, iterators can be easier to understand. Yeah, uh, and, and the bottom line is it's also all about the flex, as many would say. Comparing performance, loops versus iterators. Uh, here's the other kicker here. You see these two things, they have the for loop and they have the iterator loop. Uh, <coughs> I would not say that it's sound advice to suggest one over the other for the purposes of performance. They are showing a difference here, but generally, generally speaking, I would say that they're both the same. Right? So this is the difference here is between 19.6 million and 19.2 million. Uh, I wouldn't say that one is ever slightly faster consistently over the other. You write in whatever style you like better, and Rust can optimize either one of them to be just as performant, you know, generally speaking. Uh, here's another example. We take a buffer, and we say that this buffer is a mutable uh, array of I32s. We take the coefficients, and we say it's 12 I64s, and we take the QLP shift, and we say it's 1. Uh, I-16, and now we're looping over the buffer length, and we're doing some crazy stuff here. Coefficients.iter, I don't know what the hell this map is doing. Is this for audio Code is taken from the audio decoder. Why is that in the book? Flex. Yeah, it's a flex. It's a, it's a QED, we're done. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's it for that chapter. So here's the deal, too. When you're writing code, don't get hung up on the iterator form. and the, the, We call it writing combinators, right? They didn't introduce that word. But that's actually what, what that is, is that's called combinatrix or combinator forms. And the reason is because all of these things, iterators, results, they very frequently have the same methods on them that do things that are very similar. You know? You'll start to see them like and then, and all of those types of things exist on, on iterators and results and, and options and all those things that can contain values. Uh, don't get hung up on that. Just write it out simply and make it work. You know? Uh, until you get to the point where you want to learn the flex, in which case join Discord, uh, you know, on Benny's time and get him to drill down and do it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Does anyone have any questions? Is everyone making good progress? How's the Discord bots coming? Uh, I haven't worked on it too much lately, but I, I mean, I had one like working a bit, and then I, then I stopped working on that and started working on a U app. And I had I built like an API out with Rocket that like interfaces with Blizzard's API, uh, and then I started working on some things. <laughs> That's an impressive response. I thought you were going to tell them that you're napping. It interfered with your napping. Yeah. It doesn't nap at all. See how busy it is. <laughs> it just gave me three things that didn't involve napping. I know. I was surprised. I thought he was going to bring up napping, but he didn't. <laughs> so I was trying to call him for three days. It turns out he was just napping. <laughs> at four in the afternoon. He was, he was working on But it sounds, I'm impressed. Oh, why you I mean, I, uh, He pulled it out of his ass. I'm impressed. That's good. That's good bullshit there. That's good. What about you, Max? How you doing? I 
hate my English teacher. <laughs> he does. Is the feeling mutual? Oh, the feeling mutual across the school. Like, if, um, like, just everybody hates the English teacher. No, I mean, does the English teacher hate you? Um, honestly, I, I can't tell. You can't tell? But I'm just going to say that all my time's taken up by all their stuff. And I'm just, I'm going to good. I, I will say I had a tremendous problem with my English teacher. Was going to the you know what's even worse, too? I had a bad English teacher last year. We're in the same room, even though I'm in 11th grade. Now, I was in the 10th. Different English teacher. Still, like, the worst class in the whole school. You have to do, like, timed writings and stuff? Not even that. It's just, I don't know. It's it, it's something beyond that. It's just personality, their attitude, and just a dislike. All right, so one time, somebody's phone went off in class, right? My friend. No, actually, this is worse. So my friend was getting up to, like, go to the bathroom or something. Her phone accidentally fell out of her pocket, right? Now our teacher, when she sees her phone, she likes to take it up. So. It fell out of pocket, she's putting it back. Teacher sees it, like, give it to me. What is that? What, what is that? She literally, it literally fell. She wasn't doing anything with it. It wasn't like she was on her phone. Put it back in her pocket. And I'm like, that's, that's kind of, that's too much. You know what I'm saying? That's like, too much. Now I get it, but I don't. All right? I mean, when I was, when I was in school, you wanted to direct me. If you had a pager or you had a cell phone in my school, they knew you were selling drugs. Your ass was alive. <laughs> they didn't just take that shit up. They knew what was going on. Like, wait a, wait a damn second. How are you spending, you know, hundred bucks a month on a on a cell phone? And they'd be like, Yeah, that's not gonna fly. <laughs> Calling the cops on you. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty penny to have a cell phone. In, you know, two thousand. It weren't cheap. It's me. No, they had the Nokia bricks. The Nokia oh, bricks. that's fine. And the Matrix 1 phone, the G1 or whatever, the G2. That was super popping too. Matrix made that phone big, mega crazy. My, I just my history teacher took up my pager. Yeah? And it took me two joints to get it back. <laughs> that's right, so you know the life. He used to sit. And he, his house was like three blocks from the school. He was like a hippie history teacher. <laughs> and he would sit in this. His living room only had like a rug on it, on the floor. He'd sit with his big plate glass window, nude, smoking weed. And everybody would talk about it. He just kind of laughed at it. Like, oh, my goodness. I remember so, like, when I was in high school, I started to be really against this notion of gateway drug. Because I was like, that doesn't make any sense. It, like, logically, it's, a, it's the dumbest notion ever. You're like, you know, gateway drug, by definition, that's going to be milk, right? I mean, or something even worse, you know. Sugar, technically. Sugar, yeah. caffeine, milk, all those are good. And then you get Oxygen. older. You get older, and then the older you get, the more you're like, eh, well, let me give something else a try. And you're kind of like, you know. <laughs> no. The reason why, the reason why marijuana is a gateway drug is because it's the first time someone tells you it's illegal, and you do it anyway. That's why it's a gateway it's drug. Right. It is entirely right. If I could add to the marijuana talk, my school always smells weed. I remember my physics class went down last year. Someone taking left grade, but I took a test because of a bunch of crazy stuff. One of them just did super high. The teacher didn't care, and I just thought that was funny. At the same time, there's also a girl that got pregnant, so you know. When I went to a Montessori school, they didn't have any funding. They didn't have their own school period, right? So we met in a building called the Community Learning Center. That's where my high school was at. Well, that building had like five different programs inside of it. One of them was for the pregnant women, right? It was called uh, 